Hey there, welcome to John Gets Games. Uh, this is another uh, Good Games vlog where I'll be discussing the various new games that I've played recently, uh, in particular the ones that I enjoyed playing, and I will also discuss what I actually think of them after usually only playing them one time. Uh, we'll be going through these in alphabetical order, and uh, before I actually jump into all those, I would like to ask that if you end up liking this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with perks like watching some videos early and advertisement free, as well as uh, being able to vote on which of those videos videos are made. Uh, now, on that note, we can start talking about these games that we're gonna, uh, that we have on the list. Uh, that is Crash Octopus, Murano, Sovereign Skies, and Terraforming Mars. Uh, now, it looks like uh, we are indeed live, so I can just keep going right on with this. Uh, and the very first game is going to be Crash Octopus. Uh, now, this is one that I picked up recently. Uh, it was a Kickstarter, uh, actually, and I backed it I can't remember, you know, six months ago, something like that. And I mostly backed it because it looked really cute. It's got great components that I'll show in just a second. Um, and it's also a dexterity game. And I often uh, gravitate towards um, Euro style games, like lots of thinky uh, engine buildy type stuff. But I also uh, can really enjoy just flicking things around a table. Crokinole is one of my favorite games. So that is definitely uh, a reason why I pay attention to some dexterity games. Uh, now this one uh, plays, uh, it looks like, one to five players, uh, and it says 20 to 30 minutes. And I played this one once at this point, and um, it was uh, a lot of fun. I played it last night. Uh, it was a three-player game, and on that note, let's actually start looking at some of these components here. As you can see, in the middle of the table, there are a bunch of pink octopus bits. You have a kind of a hemisphere octopus head, and then you also have a bunch of uh, tentacles that are scattered around. And uh, there are also boats around here and a string that kind of encircles the entire play area. Uh, I think normally you're supposed to make a circle with the string, but we were playing on a rectangular table, so we made a rectangular play area to go into. Uh, now, at this point, or I'm just taking a quick look here. Yeah, okay. So, sorry about that. Um, so what's going on in this game is each player has a boat and they have a flag and they are going to be spinning these uh, little flags in order to flick these components around. Uh, this is uh, pretty different from your average dexterity game where you're usually flicking things. Uh, so I really liked that uh, difference uh, where you're actually not flicking with your fingers, which can have, you know, a lot of uh, careening off based off of how your fingernails are. But uh, with the flags and the spinning, it felt like you had a lot of control and it seemed like a unique uh, take on the space. Now, this is a competitive game and you are trying to essentially flick these different uh, treasure tokens uh, at your boat. Um, you pick a boat at the beginning and when you hit your boat, you can put those tokens on top and you are trying to essentially load uh, one of each of the different types of treasures on to your boat uh, as quickly as you can. Um, now, as you load these things up, you will be moving a little token along some beads, and at certain points in the game, you are going to be uh, having the octopus attack. Uh, now, unfortunately, in the image that I have here, I don't actually have uh, the die that uh, is used to actually uh, do this attack, but it's a black die, and half of the faces are blank, and the other half have a pink dome on them. And you actually drop the die onto the octopus's head. In fact, you drop a lot of things onto the octopus's head during this game. Uh, during setup, you drop all of these uh, components, uh, the treasure pieces onto the head, and they kind of scatter all over the place, which is fun. Uh, now the die, you actually want to drop it onto the head so that it careens into one of your opponent's boats to knock their stuff off. Uh, and of course, they are going to be trying to do the same thing for you. And if you miss an opponent's boat, then instead you move one of these uh, octopus pieces. If it shows the pink circle, then you move the octopus head. And if it shows a blank, then you move a tentacle. Uh, now that's important because the octopus attack happens by dropping a die on the octopus head. So <laughs> if if you, um, you don't want to be attacked, then you might want to move your ship away from the head, or you might just try to move the octopus away from you, uh, preferably towards your opponent so that it's easier to knock their stuff down. Now, we played one game of this, and I think it did take about 20 minutes. It was a, a three-player game. And uh, let's see. And um, it was a blast. <laughs> we played this at a board game cafe, and we uh, actually had it come right down to the end. Uh, right on the very last octopus attack of the game, I had four out of the five goods on my boat. In fact, if you have five goods on your boat at the end of a round, then you just win. Um, but uh, we went all the way to the end, and <laughs> the very last die roll um, dropped off the head and knocked 
everything off of my boat, which means one of my opponents won with a single piece of treasure on top of their boat. And, you know, that's just part of the game. You have to be okay with uh, a situation where you could lose on the very last uh, uh, die roll. Like, I was done. I'd taken all my actions, and then I lost right there at the end. But honestly, I still had a blast with it because, well, I just, uh, you know, it. let's see here. Sorry, I'm getting a little sidetracked today. Uh, I had a blast with it because... Um, just the the stories that happened. Like there was one moment where uh, an opponent dropped a die onto the octopus head and it jumped over like three tentacles and knocked some stuff off of my boat. And that was in the middle of the game. That wasn't the very end. And we were all so shocked that it actually worked that I was okay with losing those things. Uh, and my friend Nick, who ended up winning, he <laughs> kept on having his stuff knocked off the octopus head. He kind of hung up by the octopus for a while. So he kept stacking things on and then they get knocked off. But because of that, he had a pile of treasure around his boat. So he just, it kind of seemed thematically like he was just swimming, uh, sailing around in just a pile of treasure, and it just kept falling off of his boat. Now, you're not actually allowed to flick the treasure that's closest to your boat, but uh, when you have so many pieces next to your boat, you have lots of opportunities. So yeah, I was really uh, overjoyed with this game. It was exactly what I was hoping it would be. Uh, it was very quick to teach and very quick to play. Uh, it had great table presence. Like, this one pulled a lot of attention. Uh, when people were just in the uh, board game cafe, I actually played this at a board game cafe for the first time in a year and a half. Uh, people were coming over and just asking what it was. A bunch of people tried to uh, wanted to take photos of it because it's a very photogenic game with great pieces. And uh, somebody asked me how much it was, and I looked it up, and it was about $42 shipped uh, for me over here to California. And I think that is totally great <laughs> as far as uh, having an impactful, unique play experience. And this does play up to five. Uh, so I only played it with three, and I'm curious to try it with more. And there are extra modules that come in the box, so you can actually uh, vary things up even more by uh, adding a little island, by adding a second octopus, by adding a big pink ship. Uh, it's, it's like twice as big as the other ones. I haven't even read the rules to how those work just yet, but I'm looking forward to uh, playing this one more for sure. It was a blast. It was really fun. Uh, all right, we can now move into the second game I'll be talking about today, and that one is Murano. Uh, this one is older <laughs> than the previous one. Uh, Crash Octopus is a 2021 release, and Murano is a 2014 release, so it's been quite a while. Now, uh, Murano is a Rondell-style game, and in fact, that's the reason why I played it. Um, I put out a uh, video last week where I talked about 20 different Rondell games, and uh, while I got ready for that video, I did a bunch of research on what games I wanted to play, and a bunch of friends also suggested things to me, like uh, things I should try, and a good friend of mine, Anastasia, suggested I try Murano because she really liked it. Um, about a day after she suggested that, we were able to sit down and play a two-player game of this one, and I really enjoyed it. In fact, I did talk about it in the Rondell video, but uh, I'm going to go into more details about the overall game here. Uh, in the Rondell video, I just kind of stayed uh, high level <laughs> overall with it. Uh, now, in Murano, you actually have a whole bunch of different uh, tokens, uh, different uh, uh, boats that are scattered around the outside of this island. And in this game, you don't actually control any of them. Uh, most of them are black. One of them is red, but for the most part, they are all the same. And on your turn, you're going to move a boat around the island, and then you will do the action where you land that boat. Uh, now, the mechanics for this are, are pretty straightforward. You just pick a boat and you move as far forward as you want to until it reaches another boat, or you could stop uh, before that, and then you just do the action that's printed there. Uh, now, at first glance, it seems like there is a lot going on here, <laughs> like a whole bunch of actions around the outside of the board, and there certainly are, but the uh, icons for the game are really well done, so you can tell what exactly you're trying to do with each of these actions. Now, uh, in the middle of the table, there are a bunch of different islands, and you are trying to essentially place stuff on these islands, you're trying to get victory points for doing a wide variety of things. And one of the main things that you're going to be doing is picking up uh, little tokens, different houses, as you move these boats around, and then you're going to be dropping those houses off onto various islands in order to um, do a variety of things. Um, they will give you victory points based off of what type of building they are. Uh, many of them will let you put a cube down of your uh, specific type, and those cubes uh, can be important because there is an action on the board that lets you get income based off of the number of your cubes on an island based off of, uh, multiplied by the number of certain people that are also on the island. You have roads and you have uh, uh, buildings. And there are other things that you can let you uh, make glass. So apparently that is what Murano is famous for, is glass making. And uh, hold on, I'm sorry, one quick second here. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, the thing that Murano is famous for is glass making. So you can make glass pieces over here, and then you can actually um, use that glass in order to get 
coins, and you can spend coins in order to do most of the things in this game. In fact, money can be really tight. Uh, now, <laughs> thematically, when you make this glass, it's bad for the environment. It kind of makes people angry. So you actually lose victory points uh, when you pull random glass beads out of the bag, and then you will use those beads in order to get money, in order to do a whole bunch of things. So hypothetically, losing those victory points are going to be good for you in the long run because you need money in order to do things like, well, move the boats. Uh, when you move a boat, it's free, but you can move other boats to get out of the way to then move the boat that you want to move. But moving those uh, secondary and tertiary boats are going to cost you money. Uh, also, pretty much all of the actions that you do, like buying uh, these houses and uh, doing various other things, are going to cost you money as well. Uh, so I played a two-player game of this, and when you play two players, one of the islands is blocked off. And uh, what you're going to be doing is just competing back and forth. And in this game, I, well, in this game, you can, are able to get these uh, rule breaky cards that can go in front of you. And you're going to have these hidden goals that you will be able to draw at certain action points on the board. Uh, now, these goals are going to give you victory points at the end of the game if you meet certain conditions. And these definitely dictate the kind of thing that you want to do. And when I was playing this game, I had a rule breaky card that gave me extra victory points for placing certain types of buildings on the board. So I really focused on placing those buildings, and I had, uh, right near the very beginning of the game, a endgame scoring card that gave me a bunch of points for a single island that had a bunch of these cathedral-type church things on it. So that gave me a thing to focus on, like trying to make sure that um, I was doing all of those things. Uh, my opponent, uh, Anastasia, was uh, going really hard on glass, it seemed like. Uh, they got a whole bunch of glass as the game went on. They had a rule-breaking card, which let them turn red into blue uh, glass. And then once the game was over, we revealed these cards, and we were able to score a certain number of them based off of some details I don't need to go into. And then um, we saw where the dust settled. And in fact, before we did that ending score, I had so many more points than Anastasia. Uh, like, I don't know, 40 or 50 more points. Uh, it seemed like I personally felt like I was going to win. But then we revealed these endgame cards, and she had so many points from these based off of the conditions that she made. Uh, she was able to win by a few points, I think. So it was really close there at the end. Uh, now, what that means is there's a ton of points that comes in through these cards, and you get these cards randomly. Um, you draw them from certain spots on the board, and if memory serves, you're able to choose a couple of them and then choose one. Uh, but there is still some randomness there. And, you know, you can see what your opponents are doing and say, okay, well, it appears like my opponent's going hard on glass, so maybe I should try to block that, but there's only so much blocking that you can do. And you're trying to figure out what they're doing while you're also doing your own thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it did kind of feel like uh, one way to do really well in this game is to draw the end game scoring cards that are going to work for the stuff that you have already done. Uh, it is an action to draw these cards and it costs more and more money. So that is certainly a thing to keep in mind. But uh, at the end of the game, we were discussing it. Um, my friend has played it a whole bunch of times, uh, and I've only played it this one time. And, and my friend really liked it and, you know, was recommending it. But when our, in our postmortem on the game, we were discussing how it seemed like you know, there is definitely a luck factor there. Like, are you really just doing a bunch of Euroy stuff and then hoping that your endgame scoring cards will be more lucrative than your opponents or the things that you were doing are going to work out a little bit better? Uh, but again, I've only played this one once, and I really did enjoy it. It was a really good time. If I'm being honest, I was not in the best headspace when I was filming this. I had a bit of a headache and, you know, one of those long day type situations, and I did enjoy it, but I couldn't help but feel like um, I would probably enjoy it more if I play this one again uh, with maybe more players. Not that it was bad at two, but also just in a different headspace. Uh, I definitely enjoy this one. I would um, actively look forward to playing this one again. I thought the uh, boat mechanic was pretty cool. You'd have these traffic jams, which I guess thematically makes sense. You have boats going around and you uh, sometimes, you know, if there's an action right in the middle, it might be a while till you get there or you could spend an obscene amount of money in order to move these boats to make that happen. So this is really a game about trying to figure out what the best option is to you based off of your money. And money can be super super tight. Um, once we got into the later stages of the game, we had enough abilities to get quite a bit of it. But for the first, I don't know, half of the game, it seemed like I would want to do something. I just would not have enough money to do it. So uh, there is a spot that you can go to just take two money. And that happened many times in the early parts of the game to just increase the flexibility. So yeah, I, I was really impressed with Murano. It seems like it's got a bunch of cool ideas. I like the the spatial element of growing out of the different islands. Because it was a two-player game, we did not grow the islands out as much as uh, you would at a higher player count, I'm sure. One of the islands is blocked. And by the end of the game, most of these spots, I think, were occupied. But honestly, at that point, I cared 
not a whole lot about a lot of these locations. Uh, I had a really good island for running my income, and actually it was pretty good for my opponent too. So when we ran income, uh, we, we did really well there. But, you know, this game is not necessarily about getting money, it's about getting victory points. Uh, so yeah, uh, Mirana was a cool game. I know I kind of glossed over a lot of the details of it, but it has a bunch of Euroy stuff I like, like uh, game-breaking abilities and uh, goals that you're trying to run towards. Although it did seem like when we revealed these, uh, my friend had a couple cards. They just were worth so many more points than anything I had even seen. So there is luck of the draw there, but there's a bunch of other things going on. I'm definitely not blaming my loss on luck, but it's something that I have to keep in mind. And I kind of wish that maybe it wasn't quite so prevalent uh, to the overall strategy to win the game, but but who knows? Uh, looking over here in the chat, uh, Best at Star Trek says that uh, his wife always beats him. And I suppose if you consistently lose this one to your wife, then uh, maybe it isn't that there isn't as much luck there as I, I, I might think after one play, but I don't think it's hugely luck dependent. That was just a, a vibe I got after a single play. So yeah, that is Murano, a really cool Rondell game with a whole bunch of neutral pieces that uh, I talked about, specifically the Rondell and how it kind of felt like similar other games in the, the other video. But specifically, as far as the other mechanics going on, I think there was a lot of stuff to like in this game. It's one that I did not really uh, pay that much attention to. Um, when it first came out in 2014, I think I vaguely heard about it and then just moved on. And I, I kind of wish I had paid a little bit more attention. Uh, I believe the designers are Inca and Marcus Brand. That's right. Um, and I like a lot of their games, so definitely uh, surprising. I think that this one got overlooked, but, you know, there's thousands of games that come out every year, so it's not that surprising. Uh, all right. Oh, <laughs> that's what Star Trek says. Not specifically this game, but in general, your wife beats you. Well, uh, you could definitely give this one a shot. I mean, uh, they're also mentioning that there's a lot of icons on this board, and I agree. Uh, when this one was first laid out and my friend started to teach it, uh, she said, you know, it's a really streamlined game, but, you know, you're hitting, you're getting hit with a lot of icons right at the very beginning. And that's definitely something to keep in mind uh, because, you know, it seems overwhelming at first, but a lot of these actions are kind of are duplicated. And also, once you learn them, you kind of realize, oh, they, they really are good icons. They, they tell you exactly what they do. So after, you know, a couple of turns, you start to grok where things are. And certainly by the end of the game, I had a, a very good idea of what I wanted to do based off of where these boats were and where the actions were specifically around the board. I think a second play would be even more streamlined, uh, being familiar with all of these, because the first play is going to be a lot about uh, figuring out the details of, of how the system works uh, as you kind of, you know, embed the mechanics of these icons into your brain. All right, let's now talk about the third game, which is Sovereign Skies. Uh, this one I actually played... Uh, I think the day before uh, I played Murano, uh, this was in the middle of a sprint where I was trying to play as many Rondell type games as I could as I was doing research for that Rondell's video. And Sovereign Skies has been on my list to try, uh, honestly, for a while. I mean, uh, BGG says it came out in 2020, but I feel like um, I've known about it for longer. I think it had a, a Kickstarter campaign uh, in 2019, uh, and I feel like I might have even seen it at a convention in 2018. But either way, it's been kind of floating around my consciousness, consciousness for quite some time. And it was my understanding that it's a Rondell game that is quite quick. Uh, Board Game Geek says it's a 30 to 60 minute game and the, it's being published by Deepwater Games. So uh, yeah, I was able to play a game of this. It was once again a two-player game. I actually play this with my friend Anastasia as well. Um, uh, she helped me get through quite a few of these games for research. We just kind of play, played a bunch of them over and over again. So in uh, Sovereign Skies, you have a rondelle in the middle of the table, which isn't surprising considering uh, this was uh, all about the rondelle research. And this rondelle is modular. You have these different tokens, these uh, big chunks that kind of fit together into a circle. And then each player has a single spaceship that's going to be uh, heading around this area. Now, on your turn, you're going to be moving your single token on this rondelle uh, at least one space forward, but you can go farther forward if you want to. And every step farther that you go is going to cost you energy, which is a resource that you need in order to do stuff. Now, um, when you are moving in this game, it's got a pretty interesting tweak compared to a lot of other rondelle games, where many rondelle games, especially uh, classic ones, you go in the same direction. Like in Murano, um, you actually go counterclockwise. Um, the little boats go around the boat, uh, go around the island in a counterclockwise direction. Most Rondell games have you going clockwise. And in Sovereign Skies, you can do either or. Uh, each of these chunks has an arrow going to the left or to the right. And depending on where your ship is, that will dictate the direction that you're going as you essentially, I don't know, orbit around space. The theming is, you know, from... Uh, uh, 
uh, specific space uh, standpoint. Like, I don't think there's a sun right in the middle here, but you're kind of, you know, keeping inertia as you're flying around with these spaceships. Uh, but um, so, for example, here you have a red ship that is on the rightmost token, which means it is going to be going in a clockwise direction around the rondelle. Uh, and the uh, green uh, token over here is on the left one. So it is actually heading in a counterclockwise direction. Now, you can change the direction of your travel by spending a couple of energy to switch over to the other side and then move. And this is a big difference from a lot of Rondell games. Uh, a big part of Rondell's is that you normally bypass things and you can't do them again until you go all the way around the circle. And Sovereign Sky says, well, if you bypass something to do something else, you could spend some extra energy to turn around and go back over there to do that thing again. So you could actually kind of go back and forth, although that's going to cost quite a bit of energy. So I liked that tweak uh, right off the bat. And then from a gameplay perspective, the stuff you're doing is really straightforward. Like it's, it's a streamlined game for sure. Uh, when you land on a planet, you are going to do one, two, or three actions. And if you do one action, then you will do that action and you'll gain an energy. If you do two actions, then you'll just do the two actions and then not gain or lose energy. But if you do three actions, you will actually have to spend an energy. So the number of actions that you do will dictate your gain or loss of energy. And again, you need energy in order to uh, go farther around this uh, rondelle as well as to change your direction. So energy is an important resource. Now, the actions that you're doing are um, pretty straightforward uh, on every single one of these locations. One action involves putting a dropship down. Another action... Uh, another action involves drawing a card that's specifically there, and the cards are identical uh, in the stacks, and they're associated with the different planets. And then each of these planets has a unique action. Uh, for example, one of them might let you uh, uh, pick up senator cards by discarding certain cards. Another one might let you remove dropships from a planet and then place a base down. And then um, controlling these different areas is important for gaining energy as well as other things. And I'm not going to go into all of those specifics. So as you are sailing around, uh, or I guess piloting around with your ships, you're trying to do these actions and you're trying to make sure you have enough energy to do the things that you want to do. And you are also gaining influence by um, occupying certain uh, locations and doing certain actions at, um, at different times. Again, I'm trying not to go into the specifics, but there is definitely a push and pull with a specific type of token. Um, if you are the first person to activate a spot and discard that card, you can take that token from the market and put it onto your board, and that's going to be worth three points to you. And other players, if they're able able to take control of that planet and then discard a card of that color, they could actually take that token back away from you. So there can be some uh, significant swings there, hypothetically. Now, I played this game two players, and I've only played it once. And the impression that both myself and my friend Anastasia had with this game was we were really enjoying the game of it. But then suddenly it ended. <laughs> this game ends when a certain number of these tokens are taken from the boards, and you just finish the round, and then that's it. The game is over. And it seemed like sudden. It seemed really sudden. Uh, I realized on my turn, I was kind of planning out my options. I realized suddenly I was like, oh, if I do this, then that will end the game. And that is advantageous to me because my uh, opponent was the one who started it. So I would just take my turn and then the game would be over and then we count up points. And my partner, my uh, opponent was, was surprised by that. And they were definitely looking forward to taking another turn or two. It just seemed like the game ended before we wanted it to. Uh, and I actually went on to Board Game Geek, and there are some forum posts talking about the length. Uh, and I believe uh, the designer or publisher uh, weighed in on one of them saying, you know, they designed this game to be quick. It says 30 to 60 minutes, and I think our game probably took 40, maybe 45 minutes. So it was right there. It's not like it was not delivering what was advertised, but I couldn't help but feel like I wanted a few more rounds of the game. And again, we've only played it the one time. And I think what might have happened is we kind of accidentally uh, worked down the same stack over and over again, specifically on the Senator board. And that was not arbitrary, but definitely a thing that we weren't thinking about as we were playing the game and taking these different tokens. We weren't thinking about, oh, that is going to push the end game trigger. That's going to make this game really quick compared to, oh, I don't think I'm ready. My, my plans haven't come to fruition yet. Maybe I will aim to take different tokens to kind of even those out in order to delay the game. So this isn't like a negative on the game that the game ended so quickly. It was more just a surprise uh, for both of us because we were enjoying the play of it. And uh, we both agreed that we would like to play this one more in the future. Um, it was so easy to teach and it had so many cool things going on, like some elegant uh, competition back and forth. Uh, I will admit, though, in this entire game, no one ever took one of these tokens back away from each other. I was planning on it. I was actually uh, building up my uh, uh, control of these different planets and the cards uh, ready to have a big swing turn 
turn where I was going to take two of these tokens away from my opponent. But then I realized I could just end the game and get a decent amount of points for that anyway. And based off of where things were, I was probably going to be winning the game anyway. So that's what I did. <laughs> so we did not have that push and pull. And I think that it's probably more likely to have that happen in the future. I will say that I was surprised at how much energy was flowing in the system. You need to spend energy to go farther. You need to spend two energy to change direction. And it seemed like we kind of always had the energy that we needed. And I think part of that is because when you move your token onto a spot, um, if you don't control it, but somebody else does, then they actually gain an energy. And in a two player game, there's six spots. And we just kind of naturally found ourselves in a situation where one of us controlled three and the other of us controlled three. So we were frequently getting energy when we were going onto action spots that our opponent controlled. And I can't help but wonder if with more players, you would probably control less of these areas on average, but there would be more tokens to potentially activate those specific spots. So it's hard to have a specific criticism after playing the game only once, but it seemed like it ended quicker than we expected, and it seemed like there was more energy in the system than I expected as well, to the point where on most turns, we took three actions, because we'd take those three actions and spend an energy, it seemed like we had enough energy going around. Uh, now, that's Criticism as it is, is not enough to stop me from wanting to play this one more. Uh, I did think it was a, a fun time and it's one I would like to introduce to some other people that I know. I don't think I'm to the point where I want to rush out and, and purchase a copy uh, for myself. There is a, an official uh, uh, version of this one uh, up on Tabletop Simulator that we played, um, sanctioned by the publisher and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad I got to play it. I did talk about this one in the Rondell's video, specifically because of the ability to change your direction going around the Rondell, which I thought was really cool. And um, that alone is also uh, reason enough for me to want to try this one more in the future. All right. Uh, somebody asked, have you played Hand of Fate, the board game? Uh, I've not. In fact, I've never actually heard of that game before. So uh, sorry, I, I can't really give you any uh, 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 insight on, on that one. Uh, maybe it's a Rondell game. Uh, let me know. Is it, What's the reason why I should uh, look into that one more? Uh, all right, let's now move on to the fourth game that I'll be talking about today. And that one is probably the most, easily the most hyped one that I'll be discussing. And that's Terraforming Mars, the Ares Expedition, which is also effectively Terraforming Mars, the card game. Uh, this one went up on Kickstarter a few months ago and I backed it on Kickstarter and I got my Kickstarter copy about a week and a half ago, and I've been really wanting to play this one ever since. Uh, so fortunately, last night I went to a board game cafe, again, for the first time in a year and a half. It was a lot of fun, uh, and I was able to play this one. In fact, this is the one I really wanted to play. I sat down and I said, I'm playing Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. Who wants to play with me? Uh, now, this is a one to four player game, and I was able to play this one at four players. There was a, a whole bunch of people at the meetup, so um, there was a lot of options, and a lot of people are familiar with Terraforming Mars and were curious to check this one out. So I sat down with uh, three people, and we were able to play this game. And... <laughs> right there from the image that I took about three quarters of the way through the game. There's a lot on this table, despite the fact that it's, you know, supposed to be a more streamlined version of Terraforming Mars. Um, now, Terraforming Mars, uh, the base game, has a big board in the middle of the table, and you are going to be building engines by playing cards. It's kind of funny that this is Terraforming Mars, the card game, when the base board game of Terraforming Mars is effectively a card game. Like, the game really centers all around this massive deck of cards. But there's also a deck of cards here. And in Ares Expedition, you don't have a big board in the middle of the table. Uh, there is a little board, but honestly, it's just there for some tracks. Because just like in the big version of the board game, you are collectively going to be uh, adding nine ocean tiles to the planet. You will be increasing the temperature of the planet, and you will be increasing the oxygen level. And once the temperature and oxygen tracks are maxed out and all of the nine oceans are on the planet, that is how the game ends. Uh, no matter what the player count um, is, and that's, you know, a same, the same thing that happened in the base game. Uh, now, mechanically, there's some pretty big differences and huge similarities between Ares Expedition and the base game of Terraforming Mars. Um, the similarities involve the cards themselves. The engine building nature of them is super similar. The layout of the cards is different. They kind of changed where some of the icons are, but these cards have uh, tags on them, which can be interactive with uh, through various other cards. Every single card in the game has English text on them, which tells you exactly what all of the icons do, which is great, especially when you are teaching the game. Uh, and as you are playing these cards out, you're going to be building out the ability to produce a bunch of resources, and you're going to get a bunch of actions that you can uh, activate to do various things. Ultimately, 
trying to terraform Mars and get the most victory points. Now, the big way that this is different is the, ac uh, the activation of the actions. Now, in terraforming Mars, the board game, uh, on your turn, you're going to take two actions, uh, or one or two actions, and you can do a huge variety of things with those. You could play cards, you could activate cards, you could do just a ton of different things, and then you are always going to produce all of your stuff at the end of each of your rounds. Now, uh, Ares Expedition is different. In fact, it uses an action selection system that is virtually identical to the one in Race for the Galaxy. The way this works is each player has a deck of, uh, a hand of five phase cards, and you will all simultaneously place a phase card down, face down, and then you reveal them, and then only the phases that were that show up on those cards will be activated in that specific round. Uh, there are five, fa five phases. The first one is development, and when this one happens, everyone around the table can play up to one green card. Uh, after that, there's construction, and when this happens, everyone can play up to one blue or red card. After that, there is the action phase, and when this is active, all players can perform the actions that are showing up on the cards that they've already played, or they could do the standard actions which are printed on everybody's player board. So as you can see right there from the first three phases, you have to have specific phases to put cards down into your tableau, and then you can't really touch those cards in your tableau until you activate other specific phases, like the action phase in particular. Now, after that, there is the production phase, and remember, in the board game version of Terraforming Mars, you always produce all of your stuff every single round, but that's different in Ares Expedition. You only produce your money and your plants and your heat uh, when the production action is taken, and if that action isn't taken, then you don't make the stuff, and then you might not have the resources and things that you need to do the various other actions. Uh, now, the final phase is research, and this one just lets you draw cards from the deck. You can uh, draw two, choose one, or you could draw five and choose three, and that is where the bonuses come into play. And again, this is essentially the same as Race for the Galaxy, where the players who actually choose the phases get to do that phase slightly different. So, for example, if um, you select action phase, which is something that I did, and it looks like my uh, opponent to my left did as well, we both got to activate all of our actions just like our opponents, but we got to activate one of our cards a second time. Normally, you can only activate each card once, so that is a big perk. Uh, if you are the person to play the research out, then you draw five cards, keep two, whereas everybody else draws two, keep one, so that's a big difference. And then the other ones give you other benefits like discounts or the ability to play multiple cards. So the way that uh, so what that means is the flow of this game feels different from Terraforming Mars the base game, where, you know, in that one, you're playing cards that you keep going until everybody passes, and then you run your production. In this one, you, you know, all play these cards out, and then uh, for, in this example right here, construction was picked, and then actions were picked, so we all played one or two cards, and then we all got to activate our actions, and then that was it. Um, there was no production, we were not able to play any green cards, so if you had a bunch of green cards in your hand like I did, well, that would be kind of detrimental. Now, an interesting tweak to this action selection system uh, that Ares Expedition brings in is the fact that you cannot choose the same action twice. Um, you have the previous one uh, on the table, face up, and then you have to choose from the other four. You place that face down, then you reveal it and take the previous one back into your hand. So, uh, except for the very first action of the game, you are going to be uh, choosing from four options every single turn. And there are many times when, during this game, uh, again, I've only played it the one time, where I wanted to play the same action multiple times. In particular, I had a pretty good card draw engine going on, and I had a bunch of discounts. Uh, I was able to play cards for a lot less money than I was supposed to, but I kept drawing green cards from the top of the deck. I had some card uh, production, which meant when production happens, I got to draw random cards from the top of the deck, and it seems like I kept drawing green cards. I did draw some other cards, but... That, what that meant is almost every round I found myself wanting to play the develop action so that I could make sure to get a green card out, but you could only do that every other round because you have to choose something that's not on the table. And there were many many times where I chose not development because it was on the table already and somebody else went with development so I could play a card in that moment. But this definitely is going to be dictated by the options that you have. And I really liked that restriction. Uh, now, in this game, uh, we played four players, and two of us are very experienced board gamers. Uh, uh, myself and uh, my friend Nick, uh, I joked that um, I could have taught Nick this game in about 20 to 30 seconds uh, because he's very experienced with Race for the Galaxy and he's very very experienced with Terraforming Mars. If you're familiar with those two games, then the teach for this game is lightning fast. In fact, there is a quick uh, start rules uh, rule book in the box that's separate from the main one that just says, if you know these games, these are how they are slightly different. So you can essentially learn the game by reading that one piece of uh, uh, manual page. 
So in this game, we had two experienced people, and then we had two people who were not experienced at all. One of them had played Terraforming Mars a long time ago, and the other person um, had never really played an engine building game before. They had played, you know, maybe 10 modern board games, and they had never heard of Race for the Galaxy or Terraforming Mars or engine building or, you know, production tracks or really any of these things. And it was interesting because I realized quickly, like, oh, I'm going to have to teach everything, which is fine. Uh, I was kind of expecting to say, hey, this is like Terraforming Mars and it's like Race for the Galaxy. This is how it's different. Okay, let's play. But I couldn't do that. <laughs> I had to teach how um, the action uh, system worked. I had to teach how the production system worked with the tracks, the idea that your tracks tell you how much stuff you make when you run production, and the fact that your tokens on the right are just the amount of stuff that you actually have uh, was a tripping point that, that um, the person who was not familiar with a lot of board games had to really get through. And, and it was actually pretty nice because I was sitting next to one the player who was um, very inexperienced, and my friend Nick was sitting to the other inexperienced player. So we ended up having a fully competitive game where each, myself and Nick were kind of shepherding the other person, talking them through their options and uh, letting them know the different things they could, they could do. And in the back of my head, I was wor worried that that would make this game go really long. I I've definitely heard people on Board Game Geek, lots of posts about the length of the game, specifically at lower player counts, and this is the biggest player count. Uh, but I remember thinking in my head, oh, you know, this might take a while because, you know, there's a lot of um, learning uh, things to get through here, but that's fine. You know, we were there to play games and I didn't really have a problem with that. Uh, so then I was uh, happily surprised when the game only took about 90 to 100 minutes. Uh, the box says that the game can be played in an hour, and with that in mind, I really do think that I could have played an hour-long game of this with four people who are familiar with Terraforming Mars and Race for the Galaxy. I think if all of us had never played Ares Expedition before, but we were familiar with those two games, I really do think we could have uh, completed a game in an hour. Uh, now, the game actually comes with a pre-shuffled deck that has some uh, starting cards that it suggests for your first game. You deal those out so everybody has those in their hand. Uh, and I learned about that after I'd shuffled that deck like crazy. I didn't realize it was pre-shuffled. So I said, you know, I'm not going to worry about pulling those out. So we just played the game completely randomly from that deck. And it worked out really well. So um, I lost... I came in third place, <laughs> which uh, means, you know, I, I don't have a uh, winner's bias going on here, but I, I still really enjoyed the situation. And I think part of that is because I was spending quite a bit of attention, um, you know, making sure that the person who was not familiar with the game was enjoying it and figuring out that what their options were and where they could be going. I kind of shot from the hip with the cards I was playing. I was like, oh, I can play this, so I can play this. And I definitely had some cool engine stuff going on, but I did not focus enough on victory points, which is, of course, how you play the game, uh, how you win the game. Uh, I had so many discounts that many of the cards I played were free, which is great, but, you know, free cards don't necessarily mean lots of victory points at the end of the game. Uh, now, at the end, of, uh, when the game was over, I, I chatted with my friends, uh, with the people around the table that we were playing with, uh, and my friend Nick um, really liked it, uh, and the other two people who were, um, you know, not as familiar with board games also really liked it. I mean, the person who was very new to this stuff was quite overwhelmed by the options and things going throughout the game, but it did seem like they were figuring it out as the game went on and starting to um, see how it all would click together, and it was fun to watch those kind of realizations dawn as they figured out, oh, they had a pretty good plant generation engine going, and they got a bunch of plants from that, and they could kind of see how they could leverage those options. Uh, my friend Nick, who's played Terraforming Mars a whole bunch, uh, said when the game was over that this game will likely replace Terraforming Mars, the base game, for him. Um, he really liked the tweak on the uh, Race for the Galaxy um, action selection system where you cannot choose the same one over and over again. And um, we all enjoyed the simultaneous nature of this game. I didn't mention that, but within each of these phases, you can take your actions simultaneously, which does quick uh, make the game quicker to play, uh, which is, you know, nice overall. Although, I will admit that there is something about you know, being witnessed. I actually saw somebody uh, talk about this on Twitter, and I cannot remember who did it, so I'd, I'd love to attribute it, but they, they talked about the idea that simultaneous play is not always the best thing because it's fun to have people watch you do cool things. And in Terraforming Mars, the board game, you can pull off some really cool things, and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a gloating thing to a certain extent, like, oh, I'm going to have a great turn, and then you do the great turn, and people watch you have that great turn. In Ares Expedition, I honestly had no idea what uh, my opponents across the table were doing. Uh, when the game ended and Nick blew us out of the water, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what were you doing over there? Not that I thought I was going to win, but I realized I had not really paid any attention to what uh, he was doing at all because uh, I was focusing on my area and the person who is next to me. And I think 
in future plays, there's probably going to be some of that as well because you play so much simultaneous that you're just kind of doing the thing in front of you and you should look up and be like, okay, am I the only one going for heat or are lots of us going for heat? So maybe that's, you know, going to max out too quickly. It is important to pay some attention to what your opponents are doing, but there is, a, due to the simultaneous nature, there is a quality to the game where, you know, you're not super sure of what your opponents are doing. They're doing stuff over there. They're building engines and you're hoping that your engine is going to be good enough. Uh, for me, um, I, I will admit that I like how quick it was to play, especially if I was to play this with more experienced players. I, I do think you could knock this out in 60 minutes. Um, and I love engine building games and I love Terraforming Mars, the board game. Uh, I have it rated a 10 out of 10 on Board Game Geek. I adore that game, specifically when playing with the drafting variant. And in my experience, those games usually take between two to two and a half hours, regardless of the player count. And that is certainly a lot longer than uh, Ares Expedition, at least, you know, uh, based off of what we saw here. And so for that playtime and the box size, I do see myself playing this one more, and I'm not really sure if this is going to replace the base game for me. Uh, for right now, it's the shiny thing. Like, I definitely want to play this one more. Uh, there were lots of cards that I drew into my hand, and I was like, wait, what? That's so cool. And I was, like, excited to play the card uh, that would work with uh, other things that I was doing. So I enjoyed that aspect to it. But, you know, there is something about the grandeur of the base uh, of the board game with the big board in the middle and the adjacencies that you have and um, also the way the engine building works is very similar between the two, but I wouldn't say they were the same. Uh, so I own both at the moment. So fortunately, I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, do I pick one or the other? I have both as an option. And I think I will be pushing to play Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition more than the base game for uh, the time being. Um, and I don't think I'll make the decision about if one fires the other for many games. And, and honestly, I, I love Terraforming Mars, the base game, so much that even if I ended up deciding that this does essentially replace that one, I would be hard-pressed to get rid of the other one because it is a longer experience, but I think it is also probably a deeper experience, especially with the drafting going on. Uh, in this game, you uh, if you have production for cards, then you're drawing them randomly. Um, and you also have this research spot, which lets you draw cards and then choose, uh, keep some of them. And uh, my friend Nick, who won the game, researched like crazy in this game. And at the end, he said he was doing that because he was digging for specific cards. Uh, in particular, he was digging for event cards because he had some really good bonuses for those. When he played events, he got plants and he got extra money and he got discounts for events. And he was able to really work all that together. So he's spent a lot of the game digging for the best cards and he won by a long shot. So that is interesting <laughs> that he was able to get so many victory points compared to me, even though I drew two random cards during every single production. Um, so th having the right cards is important. And when you're playing Terraforming Mars, the base game with the drafting variant, you see a lot of different cards. So I think you can build more intricate and satisfying engines in the base, uh, the board game version of Terraforming Mars. But that's not to say that the engines that you build here are not intricate or not interesting. I really enjoyed the thing that I had going on, even though it didn't end up turning into that many victory points. And of course, uh, my friend Nick was, was really enjoying the kind of event-based system that they had going on, and they played their actions specifically to try and maximize the benefit that they got from those, and they definitely made that happen. Nick wins a lot of games, so I wasn't super surprised when he won, but he won by quite a bit. So yeah, that's essentially where I'm at with Ares Expedition. I super enjoyed it. Uh, it was great at four players, and I would have no problem playing it with less. I know that the biggest kind of hubbub about uh, Ares Expedition has to do with the two-player game, uh, because you don't actually change anything in the game. In a two-player game, you just have two less players than a four-player game. And what that means is uh, at most two of these actions are going to be activated in a two-player game, and um, probably somewhat frequently only one will because you might both do the same thing. So that means the rounds will be quick, but quick rounds are not necessarily a big problem. But much like the ba uh, board game version of Terraforming Mars, you don't change the track lengths. So that means in a two-player game, the same amount of stuff needs to happen as a four-player game, which means you're going to do, on average, twice as much of that building, which means the um, engine that you're building is probably going to be a lot bigger and potentially more intricate, but probably more uh, impactful in a two-player experience, which is one of the reasons why I certainly wouldn't mind trying it. But there are a ton of posts on Board Game Geek right now with people um, coming up with two-player variants. So I can't speak to it, but it does seem like a lot of people feel like a variant to make the two-player game better 
um, is out there. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to play with any of these house rule variants for the time being, and I certainly would not shy away from trying a two-player game. Although, fortunately, now that I'm able to play board games at a weekly game night at an actual board game cafe, since uh, the vaccination rates are just very good in the Bay Area, um, I will likely frequently have a lot of people who want to play this game as opposed to just playing it two players. So I might play a two-player game at some point, but uh, for the time being, I'm just looking forward to playing it really at air pl any player count because it was a blast. Honestly, I was about to push to play it again uh, in that same night. It played so quickly. Uh, everybody else ended up needing to go elsewhere, but I remember I was waiting for a table to kind of pack up, uh, finish a game, and I, in the back of my head, I was like, I'm going to ask these people if they want to play Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition again because I would not mind playing it twice in the same night. And those people I knew would be able to learn the game in like two or three minutes, and then we'd be able to jump right in. Uh, so at this point, uh, it looks like there were quite a few comments. I'm just going to take a quick look up here. Uh, Reishi asks, how did, uh, how did you like the components for Ares, specifically the middle board and the cubes used for the temperature and oxygen tracks? Uh, so yeah, um, in the middle of the table, you have this smaller board compared to the board game version. And this board has tr tr a track around the outside for your terraforming rating, which is essentially victory points, and then other tracks for all these different things. And if I'm being honest, it felt pretty small. I've seen people complain about it being fiddly, and I could see that. Um, this terraforming rating track around the outside is very small, and you have these cubes stacked on it. And there were a couple times where I was like, was my cube here or was it over there? I felt like this track maybe could have extended farther around the board and had larger spaces to make that easier. Uh, the tokens for the uh, oxygen track and the temperature track are about 30% bigger than they probably need to be to fit on those spots there. Although we didn't have much of a problem, but again, I can't be super sure that one of these wasn't nudged accidentally. So that is not great, I suppose. And, and you know, you have these tiles for the oceans in the middle and you are flipping them over and it's easy to bonk other things. So I totally understand why some people have uh, raised concerns about the fiddliness of the central board. And unfortunately, I can't dissuade you from that. It did seem like it was more fiddly than I would have liked. Uh, I kind of wish these tracks were, you know, they're nice, they're kind of curved, which is cool, but I would have probably preferred them to be a little bit bigger. And these ocean tiles did not really need to be ocean tiles. I, I've seen people mention they could have just been cards that were flipped off to the side. And I, I agree with that. Um, it looks cool, but it definitely felt fiddlier than I was hoping it would be. Uh, let's see. Uh, Christos asked, what are the circles on the wall behind me? As a tangent, uh, I've spent too much time figuring it out. Um, the short answer to that is um, actually in a update vlog in May of 2020, I talked about this a whole bunch. Uh, so I would suggest looking for my May of 2020 update vlog and that'll explain it in great detail for you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, no pun included is here. Hey, what's up? Uh, they said, oh no, it's definitely not fun to watch combos for me. I don't have the brain space to absorb someone else's decisions on top of my own. So they're specifically talking about the idea of being witnessed, like I was talking about. And, you know, if somebody is really slow <laughs> with all the analysis paralysis of the combos they're putting together, I can definitely have that great on me. Although um, I do enjoy seeing people do stuff. Like it was a little, it was interesting in this game, uh, finishing the play and realizing what my opponent had been doing. Like, I had no idea that Nick had an event-based uh, engine going on. I had zero idea what kind of engine he was doing. I was paying attention to how much heat and how many plants were they making, but not how they were making those plants. I just kind of looked at their boards and looked at their tracks when I was trying to gauge how, where the game was and what I should push on. Um, so it was fun kind of learning the engine that they had built, but it was also a little disorienting <laughs> realizing I'd played a 90-minute game and had no idea what my opponents were doing. But, you know, it was a quick game and we were able to play so much stuff simultaneously and do a bunch of really cool things. There were many turns where I was like, oh, yeah, yes, somebody activated, you know, uh, actions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this other thing, you know, discard eight plants to put a token down and like do all those fun things. And then you kind of wait for everybody else to be done and then you move on. So uh, I'm not criticizing it. I could just say that I understand why some people might shy away from the simultaneous nature of it. But I think in general, it's a big positive for this game. Uh... Reishi says, I think Terraforming Mars and Ares are two games to own. One does not replace the other. Our friend has Terraforming Mars with the expansion, and we have Ares now, so it's a good balance of plays. Uh, yeah, uh, that's essentially where I'm at. I mean, they 
they, they have a lot of similar feelings between the two, but I, I would be really hard pressed to give up one versus the other. I do have uh, a few of the expansions for Terraforming Mars, and again, it's one of my favorite games. I freaking adore Terraforming Mars, the board game. So it's not surprising that I was set up to really enjoy Ares Expedition as well. Uh, I will say that Race for the Galaxy is a game that never quite clicked for me. Uh, I remember when that one first came out, uh, people were playing it like crazy in 2009, 10, I can't remember the specific year that came out. And I remember playing it and being mystified by the iconography. And that's kind of something the game is famous for. Like once you understand the iconography, the game totally clicks. But I love the fact that Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition has English explaining what every single one of these cards did. So when I was teaching this game to somebody who was very new to modern board games, I was able to say, you know, read the card. You know, they're like, what does this card do? I said, well, read the card. You know, just it tells you exactly what it does, what the restrictions are, what the bonuses are, when it activates. It's got all of it on there, which is really impressive and I very much appreciate. And that's definitely a, a bonus from the Race for the Galaxy uh, uh, comparison. Um, and yeah, I never right, really clicked with Race for the Galaxy. So I think uh, it's not too surprising I enjoy Ares Expedition so much. I think some of the interactions and engine building in Ares of Ex Expedition works better for my brain. I think, honestly, they might be a little bit more straightforward than Race for the Galaxy, but it's been... Um, Probably about seven years since I played that one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so Dennis asks, why not just play Race for the Galaxy? Uh, and yeah, so leading from that, um, for me personally, as I said, I never really clicked with that one. Um, but I have friends who do, uh, who could play a game of Race for the Galaxy in like 15 to 20 minutes uh, because they've played that game so many times. And I think for me, just the... The tableau building nature of Ares Expedition feels like it clicks in my brain better. I know I just said that, and it's been a long time to specifically compare it to race. Uh, but I could see a lot of people saying, well, I just play race instead, and that's totally fine. But I like the um, end game condition of this game. I like that it's just leans so heavily on the engine that you are all building together, and you have to raise all these tracks to the maximum. And, you know, I'll admit, I just love the board game. So my love for the, ba the base board game of this, uh, of Terraforming Mars, is going to bleed over into Ares Expedition, uh, whereas, you know, my initial Initial memories of Race for the Galaxy were being mystified, and you know that never totally went away as I played it a few more times. Uh, so it's hard to say exactly why it's going to work better for some people versus others. And it's been so long since I played Race that I can't speak exactly to that as much as I uh, wish I could. Um, Reishi says, which is your favorite expansion for Terraforming Mars? Um, yeah, so there are a few of them. Um, I have most of them at this point. I think the first one was Venus, and I did not like that expansion at all. Um, it's introduced a new board, and it introduced some new cards that were specific to that board, and I just felt like it wasn't necessarily, I didn't like the addition of a new board, and I didn't like the way those interacted, to the point where I've actually pulled all of my Venus stuff out of the game and I put them into a Ziploc bag. It's still in the Terraforming Mars box, but I don't really see myself using Venus again. Um, I uh, That being said, I love the Prelude expansion, which uh, brings in um, essentially a quick start version of the game where at the beginning of the game, players are going to have uh, draft these specific cards, or I guess not draft, you choose from a pool uh, that you draw from, and they just start your engine off. You just start with more stuff, which essentially speeds the game up by, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, which is not nothing. And I've really enjoyed that aspect of the game. Uh, that being said, uh, I've chatted with uh, my wife Jessica about this a bunch. She really likes Terraforming Mars, and she prefers without Prelude because she loves engine building, and she loves the idea that she started at zero, you know, all the way down the board. Everything was at zero, no cards. And then at the end of the game, she has a whole bunch of stuff and she did every single piece of that. Whereas Prelude, you know, you just play a card and it says, you know, start with three heat production and, you know, five plants and, you know, that kind of thing, which jumpstarts things and gets you into the game faster. But, you know, to a certain extent feels like a bit of a, a cheat mode in order to get things going. So I, I can understand both perspectives. Um, the... Most recent, largest expansion is Turmoil. I think that, that's what that one's called. And I've technically only played that once, and it was for a playthrough on John Gets Games on this YouTube channel. I believe I did a full play of that game. It's been a while. I can't remember specifically when that came out, but I remember really enjoying the way that worked. There's a separate board, which I didn't like for Venus, but I did like for Turmoil, where you have um, little politician fi figures that are going to be moving around to specific spots. There's new events that happen and um, quite a bit of new mechanics. And I've thought that they clicked in a really interesting way when I filmed that playthrough. And I kept meaning to play it with other people, but that hasn't actually happened. So I do have it uh, at this point. <laughs> if I want to play that, I should probably watch my video to relearn how it works because I don't remember all of the specifics. But um, I am looking forward to trying Turmoil at some 
some point. Um, it adds a lot more complexity to the game of Terraforming Mars, but I think that's fine. And I think, honestly, when I consider that, that um, adds more credence to keeping both of these in my collection. Like if I want the deeper, more complex, more stuff going on experience, that's going to be quite a bit longer. I have the, the board game version of it and I can bring out all those extra expansions. And if I want to just have a breezy engine building experience, which might take, you know, 60 to 90 minutes, well, I have Ares Expedition sitting here. Uh, we didn't even get through the whole deck in our four player game. We got through about, I think, three quarters of the deck, um, just collectively around all of us. So it's going to be many games until uh, I feel like I've actually seen all of these different things. Uh, so yeah, that is where I land with Ares Expedition. Uh, I know this is, you know, an early uh, impression because I've only played it the one time, but I do see myself playing this one more. Um, probably, I'm probably going to be pushing this one quite a bit. Uh, I do like playing new games, you know, to cover on the channel and whatnot, but I enjoyed playing that one so much that I am going to be bringing it to essentially every board game gathering. And I think a lot of my friends are going to to really enjoy that one as well. Uh, let's see here. Christos is saying that the video I made was a full playthrough, um, and uh, Christos does not play Terraforming Mars without Prelude and Turmoil because of the run-through. Oh, that's cool. Cool. I'm really glad that you enjoyed that one. Uh, yeah. Oh, Reishi says um, that video is what got you in interested in Terraforming Mars. That's just really great to see because I love that game so much. Uh, honestly, I did not expect to like Terraforming Mars, the base board game. Uh, when it came out, there was so much hype. Everyone was talking about it like crazy that I actually avoided it. <laughs> I was like, it can't be that good. Uh, so there were many months that went by where, you know, everybody was talking about how great it was. Everybody was making videos about it and I actively avoided it. And then I ended up playing at Board Game GeekCon and realized, hey, actually, this is a lot of fun. And I ended up getting a copy and I've played it well over 10 times at this point. And as I said, I rate it a 10 out of 10. I, I just adore it. Um, I like engine building and I like doing a whole bunch of stuff. And the board game uh, and Ares Expedition both let me do that. So uh, it's just fun playing a game that's just solidly in my wheelhouse. Uh, all right, that is going to bring up uh, bring this uh, to a close. Uh, I talked about four new games that I played recently, and I have a whole bunch that I'm hoping to get played as well. I have uh, a big pile of games, uh, many of which, uh, as the pandemic was going on, I would make tabletop simulator mods in order to play these games in order to cover them on the channel. But it's nice that I don't have to spend all that time scanning and editing in Photoshop and making these mods in order to just play it. I can just throw it in my bag and head over and actually uh, play the game. So uh, that's just a great new situation to be in. Obviously, things could change again in the future, but um, there's a whole bunch of stuff, specifically a few Cube Rails games I want to play. Uh, Imperium is a game I've technically played once, but I really want to play it again before I cover it in a good games vlog. I actively enjoyed the first play, uh, and I played with the Classics version, and I really want to play with Legends, and I might be able to do that next week. Uh, so after I do that, I will talk about uh, that one, as well as hopefully some more. Um, there's just a bunch of great games, and I'm just overjoyed to be able to play them again. Uh, so yeah, I think that is going to bring this to a close. Thanks to everybody who has been watching this live, and to everyone who watches it later on. Um, 